compromise between gluco and cardiocentric management of diabetes? And my answer is why should we? So um, there is no question. We should not compromise this. Actually, we should not compromise anything in life. So here also in gluco and cardiocentric, there is no need to compromise. Uh, let's have my own thoughts about this topic. So by uh, Asian Indian, we know the peculiarities of type 2 diabetes in India, who have, uh, along with all the other features of thin fat central adiposity, extremely high cardiovascular risk, which again and again we've seen uh, in inter right from inter-heart study to all the type 2 diabetes from the population. We may we see this. We don't need these statistics. It emphasizes whenever a young old person sits in front of me with diagnosis of type 2 diabetes for last five years, I know what are the problems with that person and I need to be very much aware of it. So whenever there is a diabetes, type 2 diabetes, it is increased risk of, of we know microvascular disease, but at the same time, separate risk now we mentioned for heart failure, atherosclerotic disease and events of myocardial infarction and stroke. So uh, we all know this and we need to remind ourselves every time a gentleman or a lady is sitting, looking very healthy, exercising every day, she says, no, I'm absolutely fine. But we need to remind ourselves that this person is at such a high risk and I need to take care of it. So there is a difference when someone gets diabetes, like these are the gray bars. And when the risk factors gets added, you can see the cumulative risk, which is much more compared to non-diabetics when the all three standard risk factors of cholesterol, smoking and hypertension gets added in a person with diabetes, the risk shoots up and it's really, really high risk population. And we all know these are the risks which are much higher in men and women once there is a diabetes compared to non-diabetic. So we need to manage blood pressure, lipids, microalbuminia, glucose and everything. We cannot say I will concentrate on glucose or cardiocentric. STINO2 trial, which actually the first multifactorial intervention trial, which showed even the STINO2 follow-up, that aggressive control of lipids, blood pressure, and glucose actually decreases the risk by 55%, including mortality. So it protects the vascular tree if we control these three major risk factors in a type 2 diabetes person. But what the reduction was there, 60% reduction came from lipids, 60%. And remaining 40% came from blood pressure and the glucose control. So no doubt, controlling lipids, and it, we need to be very aggressive. So we have seen these graphs by Subodh Varma in all HGLT2 trials. The problem here is we need renal protection throughout. We need heart failure protection throughout, right from diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Major events, yes, as a secondary prevention. These are the words which we use whenever we talk about cardiovascular risk, secondary prevention and primary prevention. The problem here is when we talk primary prevention, it's a huge spectrum of type 2 diabetes patients whom we see every day. Having a patient who has an event is very easy. Like I'm assessing the cardiovascular risk and I have to answer because the first thing I'm designing my prescription, the first thing is that ASCVD yes or ASCVD no. That will bifurcate my thinking. Okay, so if there is a patient with prior event, then it's very easy. It's a secondary prevention and we know that it's extremely high risk. I need to do one, two, three, four. Now, when there is no prior events, then there is a big spectrum. The patient may have a signs of established cardiovascular disease or patient may not have the signs. So if patient doesn't have the sign, does the patient belongs to big, big area? He can be here, stress test is negative, 2 d echo is normal. Next day he gets an infarct. Within 24 hours, he's, he crosses the line and he goes to the patients with the prior event. And you can't predict. It's very difficult. So just by having an event, it crosses the line. Until that time, we are not aggressive because it's primary prevention. So it's a big spectrum, even with established CVD. 
Now, if there is no established cardiovascular disease, again, a patient may have a multiple risk factors or there can be a simple type 2 diabetic 40 years or 42, 45 years old person, athletic, good exercise, no smoking, no blood pressure, no family history, normal lipids, everything is good. So still, these two people who has a multiple risk or he has a smoking are different. Even a person with no risk but has a strong family history of a cardiac disease goes nearer this line, though he doesn't have obesity or smoking or hypertension. So what my point is, when there is no event for a person to categorize this patient as only primary prevention is very difficult. And we need to judge that patient with the multiple things. There are a lot of things which are usually not taken into account. Like when we assess cardiovascular risk, again and again and again, many, many studies will show that standard risk factors predict the cardiovascular risk much better than any kind of a new kind of algorithms. Like smoking. Most of the time, what is forgotten when we take into assessment is the family history and the duration of diabetes. Many a times, a lot of risk score engines do not take into account duration of diabetes. And if you go by just risk score, when there is no prior event or all the reports are normal, then you, we may have an underestimation of this cardiovascular risk. That's what every type 2 diabetes person sitting in front of us, we need to be extremely aggressive. We usually do ECGs, treadmill test and 2D echo. This is the standard test what every clinic is doing. They are not sufficient, we know. For every artery calcium score, I will to spend uh, one minute about it. And there are lots of studies now which show that coronary artery calcium score, if it is zero compared to more than 100, there is a huge difference in the risk. So someone, if you are not very sure whether I should give aggressive statin treatment for a person, and the CAC score is say about 100 or about 90, it becomes an additional kind of a um, thing in your prescription that yes, I need to be aggressive. I need to have choices of the drugs, which will have a very good effect on the cardiovascular risk. So we need to do more of a coronary artery calcium score, which may help. At the same time, we will be getting the studies when the CAC score is less than zero, and still type 2 diabetic people are having more cardiovascular events. So this is also very true. So judging the risk, all these tests, we, no one asks them for a primary prevention or just by the patient to know them. These are fancy tests, may help, may not help. Biomarkers, we don't know, except anti-pro BNP again for heart failure. In some cases, not. The different ceramide score, again and again, they will tell, but the again, when it is compared, the standard risk factors predict ceramide may be slightly better in type 2 diabetes. So coming back to our clinics, the standard risk factors, duration of diabetes is very important. These types and maybe coronary artery calcium score, we need to do it. So what we need is we need to be extremely aggressive in lipid management. If you see the standard modifiable risk factor, and I'm having a cardiocentric approach, I, it's very easy to give a good statin, uh, aggressive statin, which I need to remind myself every now and then, every day for every patient that am I doing something wrong by not giving a good statin and not taking that LDL cholesterol to the target. So that is very important. Statins again and again have shown that the risk goes down. There is no J-shaped curve. Lower the LDL cholesterol, lower is the risk, and that has been seen in many, many trials. It is more the uh, reduction. There is a reduction of cardiovascular events. So the absolute LDL cholesterol lowering has, a, I'm not going into details of the lipid management, but just... I want to again aggressively say that aggressive use of statin, it's not only reduction in LDL cholesterol, but how many years patient was in the low lipid years. So if the LDL is down, there is a tendency to reduce the dose of a good statin. It should not be done. And we need to judge the patient's risk. The more number of years patient has a low LDL, it helps. So reduction cumulative over time is also very important. 
I just chose statin as an example because I think it's very, very important when we are having a cardiocentric approach. It's not only for the just choice of anti-diabetic drugs. I think my slides are not moving, but uh, I intend to say yes. So the, this question we need to ask um, that are we aggressive enough when we use statin? Sorry. So our answer when we are managing patients with statin, we need to be very aggressive and we are not. That's what my point is. So when we are having a cardiocentric approach, it's not only SGLT2 inhibitors, but it also a good control of good use of statins. Now, this is a paper by Nabeed Sattar, which uh, he has been replicated these statistics again and again in data from all over the world. What he shows that age at diagnosis, when it is below 40, the hazard ratio for the risk of coronary heart disease, AMI, stroke, and heart failure can be, you can see, three to four times higher. You can see for the heart failure, for a type 2 diabetes, if he gets diagnosed early, the risk of cardiovascular risk is much, much higher than someone who doesn't have diabetes at that age. And we see lots of population who have this type 2 diagnosed very early in life. So, and this has, he, he has presented that in 2019, the same kind of a statistics been replicated from the data all over the world. So this was his uh, Swedish study. So what are the clinical implications? Risk factor control may need to be more aggressive in people developing diabetes at a younger age. Here only the patient sits in front of you, hell and hearty exercising, and we become less aggressive because the patient looks good. Here we need to remind ourselves about the CV risk that person is having. Many elderly patients, when they get diabetes diagnosed after 70 years, the aggressive management may be slightly less. So even screening has to be things. So clinically, how to screen, as I discussed, is very important. Diagnosing heart failure is a big challenge. And we know that it's very difficult to diagnose. We need to guess. Then women need aggressive assessment and aggressive treatment, especially everything which is cardiac. Statin in primary prevention is very, very important. Whenever needed aspirin, don't, we should not, be, um, should not have any doubts. Choice of anti-diabetic drugs, which are cardiocentric, should be very routinely used, and we should not hesitate to use such drug in a primary prevention also. Combinations, combinations, and combination of drugs is the answer. What about glucocentric? Is it wrong? Yes, glucocentric is the very, very important. We know that UKPDS, legacy effects, we know right from day one, if it's a good A1C, there is a good benefit. We know accord advance the uh, whatever the advantages of intensive glucose control, though non-fetal MI were significantly reduced in accord, we know which was at the cost of hypoglycemia and the weight gain. So definitely um, we have these issues when we do intensive glucose control. So whenever there is a A1C going down, there's slightly J-shaped curve, which actually increases hazard ratio, which we have seen mainly in the accord and uh, I called an intensive control trial. So hypoglycemia is the bad thing. It predicts future events. It predicts overall mortality. So all these intensive control trials have shown very high risk of hypoglycemia. And it triggers parasympathetic stimulation, adrenaline release, electrophysiology changes. This is the ECG after a few hours of hypoglycemia, which is showing how the QTC interval is prolonged. So uh, there's an increased systolic blood pressure, reduced diastolic blood pressure, cerebral perfusion goes down. So any hypoglycemia is bad. 
a severe hypoglycemia in a patient of high CV risk is very bad. We need to avoid that. So if I can have an intensive glycemic control without hypoglycemia, I want to have a glucose-centric approach. And that we have seen in trials like ADVANCE that the intensive control, if you do not have severe hypoglycemia with the correct management of the drugs, you can have a good benefit of protecting kidneys. And again, this paper in 2019 talks about whatever is the level of GFR, the benefits are same. It's not that uh, even the GFR below 60, you can see the rates of hypoglycemias are same, whether it is above 90. So there is a risk of small, but if we can achieve an intensive control without creating severe hypoglycemia, when we have loads of drugs, we have good insulin sensitizers, we have small dose thiazolidone dions, we have good basal insulins, we have SGLT2 inhibitors, we have GLP-1 analogs, and with the right combination, we can avoid hypoglycemia. At the same time, we can avoid even the weight gain. So pre per unit BMI gain and weight gain, we need to avoid that it increases 10-year cardiovascular and coronary heart disease risk, which is not only for weight gain, but also not for obese, but even for the overweight people with type 2 diabetes, the cardiovascular risk goes up. So weight reduction is the key therapeutic goal. So if I have my glucocentric approach with the intensive A1C target in my mind, and if I can achieve that without hypoglycemia or without weight gain, I should go for it. And we should go for it. And we should not fear those 6.5 A1C target, even though there is a slight high CV risk, because there is a benefit to the patients, which we are giving these young patients for their kidneys. So it's glucocentric, cardiocentric, both at the same time, kidney centric, I will say. So these are the questions which are like, do those who type 2 diabetes benefit from having combined therapy? So the answer is combinations. By beginning, right from the beginning, the pendulum is not swinging away from metformin. Pendulum is swinging away from metformin monotherapy. So we need to use combinations right from the beginning. There are secondary outcome where we can again use correct combination. And does it matter whether it's a step-by-step -step approach or I use the right combinations, which takes me as a glucocentric as well as cardiocentric. So answer is we should not compromise and we should have both the approaches to give maximum benefit to, to the patient. Thank you so much.